Hi, this is Sean Cahill, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. You're going to be lied to, because that's the rule. That is a quote from astrophysicist Eric Davis. Welcome to a new show format where a guest is going to join me looking in-depth at a well-known case, event, person, or in this case, a particular document. Often I'm getting messages from folks who are newer to the UFO subject or for some time have kind of dipped in and out and they're looking for more information on certain things that are talked about on social media or on the podcast or on other people's blogs in detail and they're not too sure of the origins or the basics. Recently at US congressional hearings, the Wilson Davis memo was admitted into public record after being brought up in the hearing by Congressman Mike Gallagher, bringing his, this document back to the forefront of the UFO conversation. Joining me for this inaugural show is former guest and a man who is very well known for his interest and work on the legitimacy of the Wilson Davis memo, especially his fantastic mega blog, which you can find at ufojoe.net, and the links for that are in the description. I've got Joe Murgia. Joe, welcome back to the podcast. Andy, thanks so much for having me back. It's been a while. How long has it been? Like a year? At least a year. Uh, yeah, I think it's been over a year when I look back through the messages. We've always kind of been in touch back and forward anyway, but yeah, this is a uh, long overdue and the time certainly flies. But do you know what? I'm glad this has came up now because the timing's worked out well. Um, I've been wanting to do a show like this for quite a while, get away from the interview format or the news format. It's going to be something a little bit different. And I hope folks enjoy this and, and we can kind of crack on. Uh, Joe, you are very well known for, for the document we're going to be discussing and your work on it. You're a staunch defender of the veracity and the legitimacy of the document. We're going to go into the details and start off with a, a who, what, why, where and when of the Wilson Davis memo for those who are brand new to the subject and this particular document and then we'll build up with more information and on this neither of us know 100% of the detail the names what happened but I think Joe of, of all the people I could could speak to you're you're very well placed outside of Admiral Thomas Wilson and Dr Eric Davis themselves to discuss these documents so I'm very glad you're joining me for it. Yeah and, and I'll say that I do not know every detail, every name of what everybody did in the document. People who do know that, Giuliano Marankovic, who, when I wrote my mega blog, I could not have written it without him. And Richard Dolan and Mr. X, who was anonymous for his own personal reasons, did a five-hour deep dive, which is on YouTube. So if people want to know every detail, which to me is one of the most important stories potentially in the history of humankind, if we really do have what is talked about in the, in the documents, they should listen to that. It's a five-hour deep dive, Richard Dolan and Mr. X. I will get those links in the description for folks who want to go ahead and watch those uh, afterwards. Ideally, they listen to us first or watch us first. But I've also got the link, Joe, to your mega blog. And also the documents themselves are all in the description for this show, folks. So please do check those out as well. So let's kick off with the basics, the who, what, why, where, when. The who is an Admiral Thomas Wilson and Dr. Eric Davis. The what, the Wilson Davis memo, is a document of the conversation had between these two gentlemen, written down by Eric Davis himself, covering several aspects of the UFO conversation, including, but very much not limited to, crash retrieval programs, alien bodies, remote viewings mentioned in there, cover-ups, special access programs, you name it, it's in there in one sort of explosive document. This happened in Las Vegas, Nevada, on October 16th, 2002. And the why? Well, that's something I'm going to get into. First, Joe, I want to ask you, I suppose let's start with the, the who. Who are Admiral Thomas Wilson and Dr. Eric Davis? So Admiral Thomas Wilson, in, in 2002, he had just retired as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. When he allegedly went looking for this UFO program, he was the vice director of intelligence, the J-2, with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, pretty high up, trying to, you know, he's briefing other people in the government on intelligence. He should know everything that's going on. Eric Davis is an astrophysicist, and I have a little, just of his resume, he was, he's also an adjunct professor at Baylor University, and his research specializations and interests include breakthrough propulsion physics for interstellar flight, interstellar flight science is a long list. And the guy is brilliant. He was part of NIDS, I think, starting in 96. 
And NIDS is the National Institute of Discovery Science uh, with Robert. Robert Bigelow started it up back in the mid 90s. And Eric Davis had his own sighting back. I think it was 95. He had his own sighting in Arizona. And, and the guy is like a walking encyclopedia on UFOs. Uh, he's spoken about the crash retrieval program in various interviews. And in 2002, he had just been probably like four or five months before he allegedly met the Admiral. He had just been laid off by NIDS. So that's what happened. And then if you want me to get into what supposedly happened in 2002, we can go there next. Yeah. So just, just to summarize quickly, you've got Admiral Thomas Wilson, who pretty serious career military guy has worked his way up as in a very lofty position within the intelligence community. You've then got Dr. Eric Davis, who just from his resume, I think if you had to read off his actual full resume, you'd be here for a good hour. This guy is involved in so many different things um, and extremely intelligent, extremely bright, both from very different places, though. It's very chalk and cheese when it comes to these two, two particular characters. Now, they have a meeting which results in this document being produced by Eric Davis, like I said, October 16th, 2002, in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is the, the, the place you reside at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah, I've moved here. I started working here in 2009 and I moved here in 2010. And just so coincidentally, there's three people mentioned in the document. Also, uh, Commander Will Miller, whose letter to Eric Davis and Hal Putoff, it's addressed to Eric Davis. That letter is also in the memo, which we can talk about. I became friends with Will Miller in 2000. Um, I went to his house in 2007. I became friends with Eric Davis in 2018. So co- coincidentally, I consider, I mean, th- both of those guys I consider friends and, and they're the two of the three main players in that document. So that's a nice, interesting coincidence. So let, let's talk about first what happened then. What, what happened on October 16th, 2002, Admiral Wilson and Eric Davis are in a, I was going to say in the back seat of a car. I'm, I don't think they were in the back seat. Uh, they were probably sitting in the front, but why were they both in the same place at the same time having the discussion they were about to have? So three years before, and this is speculation, apparently Admiral Wilson wanted to talk to somebody about this. And the this is that he stumbled upon a crash retrieval not stumbled upon. He found a crash retrieval, a reverse engineering UFO program, uh, which we'll get back to how that happened in 97. And apparently he wanted to talk to somebody about it. He knew somebody, Oak Shannon, who was a physicist who worked at Los Alamos from 1988 to 2000. And before that, apparently they were friends, Oak Shannon and Admiral Wilson. And Oak Shannon also knew Eric Davis because Oak Shannon, this physicist, was part of the John Alexander advanced theoretical advanced theoretical physics project which ran from around 84 to 89 so john alexander had a group of like 20 folks who had special top secret special uh, top secret sei clearances who were interested in ufos wanted to get to the bottom of it wanted to find out what the government knew so they would meet um at this location and oak shannon was one of the folks who was part of that group so he knew eric davis through that, or I'm not sure if you knew him before, but they knew each other through that. So Oak knew, Oak Shannon knew Admiral Wilson, and he knew Eric Davis. And he said, hey, if you want to talk to somebody about what happened, I know a perfect person. He's not in the government, doesn't have clearances. You can talk to him. Very, very reliable. So that was 1999. It didn't take place till three years later where finally Wilson said, okay, I'll meet with him. Um, And also the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, those folks vouched for Davis too. Admiral Wilson went and did his own background check on Davis. He was comfortable enough that Davis wasn't go to the me- wasn't going to go to the media. He was going to keep it private. And Wilson felt comfortable doing that. And there are people out there who said, this makes absolutely no sense. Why an admiral will tell this, this he's just going to go to Eric Davis and just start talking to him? Well, it took three years. And he thought about it. If you read the documents, he said, I thought long and hard. It's not something that you take lightly. This is, you know, he wasn't read into the program, but he's he's sharing. If you believe this, it's the most important secret in the history of our planet, our country. And he's meeting with Eric Davis based on the word of the the AF, AFIO. I'm trying to get that right. But Oak Shannon, his friend, is like, this is a guy you can really trust. 
Um, let me ask. Let, let me ask though. T- to what end? Because I know what your point is there, but I sort of agree that if I am Admiral Wilson and I have come across this uh, special access program, black budget, whatever people want to call it, and I'm finding out about these potential crash retrieval programs and whatnot. Why do I want to go and find someone to speak to about it? Surely there would be people within my own community that I could go and speak to. You know, he's already talking to people like Will Miller and and such. Why is he looking for someone out with that to have that conversation at all? Well, at that point, he had lost his trust in Will Miller because Will Miller spoke to other people about their meeting in 1997. And it was a big deal for him. It's like, oh, it's Navy camaraderie. You don't share this information. Um, but he did. Are you still there, Andy? You look yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm here. Yeah, I'm, so, ju- yeah. I'm just fascinated. Yeah, go on. So Will Miller. So that was that was out. He was, according to the documents, he was livid that Will Miller spoke spoke to Stephen Greer afterwards and talked to Mitchell and went to Leslie Kane, which who wrote articles in the year 2000, um, not referencing Miller by name, not referencing Wilson by name, but but if you read the documents, it's pretty obvious it's Admiral Wilson. And he got calls later on. People were making fun of him. Oh, you're interested in UFOs. So Miller was out. And he had already been told by the special access, not the, the, the it's called the senior review group, because he was turned down. We're, we're skipping ahead, but he was not given access to this program. So he put up a fight and the senior review group, very high up related to the special access program oversight committee. They said, listen, if you keep pursuing this, you're going to not get your promotion to the director of the DIA, you, you're going to lose a star and you're going to get early retirement. So he couldn't go to people that he knew. He had to just shut up. Eric Davis was not in the government. Eric Davis was totally outside of that. And he had Oak Shannon's backing. So apparently he felt comfortable enough to go and speak to Eric Davis. And to none of those end, other folks would find out about it until to, to what, the documents leaked. To what end, though, was he wanting to have that conversation? What did he hope would come of, okay, I've got this guy, here's a contact, I'm told he's reliable, I've got plenty of people vouching for him, it's Eric Davis. What does he hope to achieve by having that conversation at all? Uh, And I'm speculating here because we don't know that. I'm speculating that, and this, I think, the man, I'm trying to think of his name, Who I want to give credit to the person who first brought this up, it was the Australian James Rigney who threw out this theory that Admiral Wilson, wa- you know, he wanted this story out. He couldn't get it out himself. Most, if if he believed what he was told that this was a reverse engineering UFO program, he wanted the story out. And maybe if he told Eric Davis, who was interested in this subject, who had that background, he possibly could get to the bottom of this, and maybe the story would get out. If you listen to Bob McGuire, a scientist. Bob McGuire says he saw a letter in 2004 or 2005, end of 2004, beginning of 2005, where Wilson was still pursuing this. That was seven years after he first encountered this program. If you believe Bob McGuire that Wilson was still looking into this, you know, seven years later, that meant he still wanted to get to the bottom of it, but he couldn't figure out a way to get the story out. I mean, if you really believe that program existed, the whole world should know about it. So I'm, I'm speculating he saw Eric Davis as a possibility. If he told the story, maybe Davis and his NIDS folks could get to the bottom of it. If the, is that why that happened? I don't know. It's speculation. The The document itself has a lot of incredible claims, a lot of incredible points. But I want to ask, is it commonplace for someone like Eric Davis to document a conversation like that? Because it does read like a script, and I know that's one of the things that is thrown at this document as an accusation, right. is that it's a fake script. And that that is how it reads. It's almost formatted as well, like a script. It's got the initials, the conversation. And I'd like to also ask, is Eric Davis, you know him personally, known for having an exceptional memory? Because I know if I had an hour-long, two-hour-long conversation, which I do for interviews, I remember about five or six bullet points. Eric Davis seems to have almost a, a, an, an annotated, I think that's the word, word-for-word playback of the conversation, right. or a very good one at least. So for me, it doesn't read like a script. For me, it reads like, I have so many messages from Eric, just personal messages, and it reads like his messages, except for the formatting, of course. Um, so when I read it, I hear, I hear the way he writes, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. 
he has a memory like you would not believe. I've never met anybody with a memory like him. And I'm like, you're a walking encyclopedia. No matter what I ask you, it's like the details he brings up. And he's like, yeah, he goes, Hal, my boss, Hal Putoff, said the same thing. And I'm like a walking encyclopedia. As far as him memorizing what happened in that hour and 10 minute meeting, um, I have reason to believe that it may have been recorded. I don't know if that's the case, but I don't know what the word is. I know I know Gary Nolan, has, there's a word when somebody has that memory, it's like it's so off the chart. You could just remember every word that was said. So I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened if he took notes afterwards, if he took notes during it, if he knows shorthand, if he recorded it. Um, so, yeah, not a script like I, you know, we can get to it over the last two and a half, three years. I have no doubt that it's a real, you know, it's a real document that describes what happened when they were in that meeting in October 16, 2002. It's not a, it's not a movie script. Um, that was floated by John Greenwald as a possibility. It's not, uh, Tim McMillan floated the possibility that yes, it happened, but Admiral Wilson was a fake Admiral Wilson that fooled Eric Davis, which is preposterous. And, and I think Tim, Tim McMillan knows that have no idea why he put that out there. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going beyond everything in the document is legit. I'm just saying the meeting happened. I believe that a thousand percent, whether or not there's a crash retrieval program and everything in that document is real. I think we're going to find out hopefully in my lifetime, definitely in yours, I would hope because you're younger. Um, but I don't know for sure. I mean, I want to make it clear. I don't know for sure. We have a crash retrieval program. I have a strong opinion based on what Eric Davis has said publicly in other interviews, but I want to see it for myself, Andy. Now we have Gallagher Enter it into the record. That's step one. Gary Nolan says that the, the immunity language for these folks in these programs is 90% complete. So we're making progress. Whether or not we hear about that or it happens in closed sessions with Congress, I don't know. Well, let's not get too far ahead because we will get to the, the congressional okay. side of things and get right up to date. So, so far we know who's involved in terms of the main players and the name of the document itself. And we've touched on the fact that where it happened was in Vegas in a car park. And we know that there are some incredible claims within the document. So you've mentioned crash retrieval programs. What else within the document, Joe, for you stands out as being a wow? Because I think there's quite a lot of them, to be honest. You know, that's that's the main thing. A crash retrieval reverse engineering program. The folks involved believed, you know, it was not made by not made by man, not made by human hands. And they believed that it could fly through air, water, space, and possibly possibly dimensions. It's funny because you read, it talks about how it was so compartmentalized that they couldn't go outside and get access to anybody they wanted to say, hey, help us with this problem on this, you know, and this is not just related to UFOs, any program where it's a very small bigot list, people who are allowed access to the program, they just can't go to their next door neighbor who may know X, Y, and Z and say, Hey, I got this problem. Could you help me figure it out? No, they have to be read into the program. They have to have a need to know. So it talks about how the program just, just grinded to a halt as far as progress. And then you hear Eric Davis in his interviews, he says the same exact thing. He repeats a lot of what is in this document in his interviews about crash retrievals. So, and they mentioned bodies, but bodies is not a big part of this discussion in here. Um, the big, the big part of it is how he, how he went searching, how, how Wilson went searching, how he found out who he spoke to and how he went out to the program and how they said, and people are like, why would that program, it's so secretive. Why would they tell him? Why would they tell him the truth that this is a reverse engineering? Why would they just, why would they just lie to him? Maybe they did lie to him. Maybe it was something else. And my speculation is he had a pretty high par part in the government, you know, the vice director of intelligence, they were found out by him. They had had a problem in the past where somebody found them and they were audited. And that was a big problem and it concerned them. So maybe they wanted to get rid of Wilson. They said, we'll tell him, we'll tell him what we are. We're not going to give him access. Hopefully this will make him go away. Um, so, but like I said, that's speculation on my part. Uh, there was a, there was a, a, there was an attorney. He met with the program security, head of security and the program manager. The program manager is who told him, you know, the details about the program. And they said, you know, it's not a, it's not a foreign technology reverse engineering. It's nothing like that. And that's when they said, you know, not made by human hands. When I read, um, 
Admiral Wilson's discussion of, of how he went about trying to find out about these programs, the, the person that sprung to mind was Tom DeLong, who talked about knocking on doors, various different stovepipes. Now, Tom DeLong didn't have the clearance at all that an Admiral Wilson would have had, but Tom DeLong somehow managed to still meet the right people and along the way get that group together that eventually included the people that we, we kind of know from To The Stars Academy and others. Um, do you think an Admiral Wilson is someone that Tom DeLong maybe, not to get too off topic, but spoke to along the way? I don't know if he spoke to Wilson, um, but what you talk about, and I'm not saying DeLong was able to do this, but Eric Davis in one of his interviews, which is on my blog, he talks about how you get information, how people, certain people are read into the program. He goes, you don't necessarily have to be read into a program to get information about it. Um, he says, like, if you're working with folks and they find out you worked on UFOs and they're like, oh, I worked on UFO too, UFOs too. Here's what I can tell you to a point. You don't have the need to know, but I could tell you X, Y, and Z. The rest, I cannot tell you unless you get proper clearance and you get read into the program. I think Eric Davis, at least since 2002, was working on speaking with people in these programs. And he's accused people are like, I think people like Brian Bender say, it's all hearsay. It's all people telling Eric Davis X, Y, and Z. Maybe that's the case. I don't know exactly what Eric Davis uncovered since 2002. It's been, it's been 20 years, but he uncovered enough to be brought in from front of Congress and Christopher Mellon confirmed this. And he spoke about this and he gave them enough information to go looking for what he, for what he claims. And Mellon was like, he needs, it needs to be taken seriously. And that's now we have, you know, we have crash retrieval language in the NDAA. So it is being taken seriously, whether or not that's really there, whether or not it's a UFO, not from this earth or not made by human hands. Hopefully we'll find out. And I might've just totally ignored your question. If I got no, off not, on a, not at all. On a tangent. Actually, you've brought up a point I was going to bring up as one of kind of four here. Now within the document, Wilson uh, vents his frustration at commander Will Miller speaking to other people, about things that he feels that he shouldn't have been talking about. But isn't that just the nature of not only the UFO subject, but just human nature in general, that even when it comes to security clearances and important information like this, it's just what happens that there's a there's an urge to have that discussion. And I suppose that the biggest example we have currently is, is Lou Elizondo, who has gone further and further and further in, in what he will and what he can say even things like when he talks about, you know, I won't tell you what I know, but, you know, he would feel somber. That that's There's a tease there and there's an assumed knowledge because when Lou says that, people like you, people like me and, and anyone listening to this, you start to use your imagination, don't you, as to, well, what would make him feel somber? Is it just an overwhelming feeling? Is it the fact that he knows something that's really dangerous or scary? And you start to have your mind go into overdrive. So... The, the human nature with these conversations, even with really high ranking individuals like like Commander Will Miller. And to be fair, in the document, he, he says he uh, Admiral Wilson felt Miller had kind of betrayed that trust and having that conversation. And but is, is, is Wilson not doing something relatively similar speaking to Eric Davis about this as well? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think I don't know exactly what was said between Miller and Wilson, you know, after that meeting. But I'm glad Will Miller spoke up. Of course, I'm glad Stephen Greer spoke up. I mean, who cares? I'm who cares about camaraderie when you're talking about something that, if it's true, it's the biggest story in you know in mankind's history. So screw camaraderie. Um, I don't know if Miller, st if Wilson still feels that way. I don't know if he really wants to get this information out. I mean, if you listen to his interviews where he denies everything. It make it's given me pause over the years, even whether or not this was legitimate or not. Um, and that was even recent. He gave he gave a total denial, which we can get into some of his denials, which some of them I think are are pretty obvious if you're open minded that he's lying about one specific point related to Oak Shan sorry, Oak Shannon. And um, but yeah, I mean, when I met Will Miller in 2007, he I remember him specifically telling me he's a pacifist. He's not your normal military guy. You talk to other guys in the world of DOD intel. They're all about patriotism, keeping the secret. Will Miller wants the story out there and he can do as much as he can to get it out. He's not doing UFOs anymore. He's retired. But he like he'll talk about he thinks we have this technology. Other people I've spoken to have said, no, no, we don't have this technology. If we do have this technology, 
Miller thinks it should benefit mankind. So he's talking about it, which I love about him. Whether or not we really have the technology is another another discussion. I don't know. It's funny, Andy. If I say I think we have the technology, people come down on me so hard. They're like, so you think the last 70 years is our technology? I'm like, I didn't say that. I think some of what we see may be our technology. And Will Miller is one of the few people who's willing to openly talk about that. He says in my interview with him that he thinks we have a craft that can go anywhere, any place, any time in the universe. So if that's true, that's a bigger secret than if we have a non-human craft in possession, if we have that technology. So uh, once again, I'm off on a tangent, but uh, I, I think that I don't think it's the same thing because. I don't think, you know, there was no agreement when when Miller spoke to those folks in the program. They didn't say, we'll tell you this, but you can't tell anybody. I mean, he's the guy, the joint chiefs. He's the, the vice director of intelligence. Who are they to tell him anything? So he was able to, you know, on his behalf, talk to he spoke to Eric Davis. Uh, he didn't make a vow to anybody else. But in his mind, Wilson betrayed him. Like I said, I'm glad it happened. Um, and hopefully we, we can talk about Oak Shannon because and, and the denial. We got to talk about the denial because Wilson's yeah. denials are really good. Before we get to that, a few other things I wanted to mention that were in the body of the... It's quite a long document, I think. Is it 16, 17 It's pages? 15 pages plus 15. two the two-page two uh, two letter from Will Miller. Yeah, and again, the link, please go and check it out, folks. It is really interesting reading, but a few things I've picked out just to discuss is that uh, personnel such as Admiral Wilson have allegedly seen documents and information on foreign governments, on incidents, cases, programs, and such. Why don't we hear more about these in terms of leaks? Surely people like Wilson and others, they're not NDA'd when it comes to other governments' information. Why doesn't more of that come out? You know, if someone from the US knows some of the Russians' info, is that not something you think would come out more readily and be more widely discussed? You would think a lot of this information would come out. I mean, that's one of the arguments the skeptics make. You think 70 years, we haven't even, we don't even have one solid UFO video that shows 90 degree turns. Not one. So, you know, I'm like, I, I understand. On that, on that Joe, that, do you know what the thing is? And I'm not saying that that's incorrect, but in this day and age, you know, when CGI is so good, I think there's there's two ways you look at any video. One, the quality is not good enough. And that includes things like Gimbal, Go Fast, or any kind of grainy, famous like Phoenix Lights footage and such. You look at it and go, it's it doesn't show you clearly enough what's happening. But the other side of the coin now, especially in 2022, if it looks too good, you just instantly think, well, it must be CGI. Me too. And you, yeah. myself, anyone listening to this, unless there's some really high up people listening to it, we have never seen what we could see as a genuine UFO video and that HD quality performing incredible maneuvers. So we don't know that there's not some stuff out there online that actually is genuine. And we're quite happy to claim it must be CGI because what is good. And again, if, if, if that, you know, if infamous black triangle video got released and we saw this thing rising out of the ocean, being filmed by some kind of pilot's phone or gun system, whatever it might be in brilliant 4k, would people still look at it and go, no, nah, that's fake. That's not real. Because I think people, what is real? People would. And, and you know, when I say there's no footage that shows 90 degree turns, I'm talking specifically about military footage. I mean, I know there's private footage that's interesting. It's so hard. I mean, I'm not a video analyst, so it's hard for me to tell if something is real. I usually err on the side of, as you said, you know, probably fake if it's too good to be real, uh, too good to be true. Um, Will Miller said something really interesting about why we don't find out more information he'd say he said um he said yeah he goes i'd opine that there are probably multiple control groups each one covering certain aspects of the ufo eti issue that is one probably covering crash retrievals and analysis another another covering collecting and analyzing reports of encounters another related to overall in oversight that's just within DOD. Additionally, there are a limited number of DOD contractors who even have the technological capability to work this issue to include analysis security. And later on, he says, he goes, they do whatever they can to let, make sure we do not have access to that. That could explain why we don't see anything of note as far as government evidence wise. I mean, we do have government documents, but Andy, I, I'm, I, I'm accused of being a believer, but I, I'm skeptical enough where I want to eventually Hopefully within the, maybe next Christmas, a year and a half, we see a military video 
with the proper, you know, documentation and provenance where this is real and it's doing something. We're like, oh my God. Unlike, like you said, the three videos, which are great and they got the conversation started, but that's not what we want to see. We all know we want what we want to see. And I think because we know pretty much that there's so much better out there and we've got the the worst of the stuff that they could get out. It's, I've, I've always said the videos are, are boring enough to those in the know and those who deal with those kind of classifications to allow them to be released. So it's that, that's what we kind of got with those. Um, another point that I thought was really interesting is Will Miller in that letter to Eric Davis that you talked about, he mentions, among other things, that he can provide to Eric Davis the name of someone who had first-hand knowledge of the US government's reproduced alien vehicles held at Area 51 and other locales around the country. That's a big wow for me and a huge standout. And I wonder, to your knowledge and your conversations over the years, did that ever go any any further? And was there any idea or speculation on who those individual or that individual might be? I don't know anything else about that, but... And, you know, I remember when Stephen Greer used to talk about that, and he was obviously getting it from... Will Miller, and I don't know whoever else, you know, Will Miller worked as the military advisor for C. SETI until he broke away and left. Um, one interesting Miller thing Miller said on that front is he said he knew somebody who was working at Area 51, and on his last day, he said, hey, Will, you know when you see those craft making those 90-degree turns and you, you thinking it's extraterrestrial? He goes, well, it's not, and the guy just walked away. So, I mean, that's not evidence of anything, but that's... I'm not sure what knowledge Will Miller has that he hasn't shared. Like in that letter to Davis, he's like, I'm not going to provide anything top secret. I don't have those clearances anymore. I used to. Um, So I'm not sure what he was privy to and why he has come to that conclusion that we have that technology. But yeah, it stood out for me too. If we have alien reproduction vehicles that can mimic the technology, that's, that's a gigantic story. I haven't heard that from any of my other sources. We've heard other people speculate about it, but Bring Will Miller in front of Congress, even if it's closed doors. Ask him what he knows. You know, I'm sure he's willing to speak. He's got to be on their list. If they have a list of people to speak with, he's got to be on that list. And something else I thought that it just shows the breadth of discussion within this document. And it's again from the letter is the point that UFOs are real. So-called alien abductions are not real. Again, that they're going into abductions, like I say, even if it's just mentioned, remote viewing, crash retrievals, all that kind of stuff. But abductions are a, a very sensitive subject to a lot of people because it covers a lot of ground, which I, I don't mean this to upset anyone, but there's very little real hard evidence for outside of someone having their own experiences, which I, I can tell you about my sighting that happened, big Ferris wheel type UFO, blah, blah, blah. I've talked about it many times. I can't prove that to you in the same way that someone having years and years of abductions, as horrible as those may be, whether physical, non-physical, I can't say they're definitely happening or not. But in this document, it's claimed that those don't happen. What what are your thoughts on that and why that was brought up? That upset so many people. And it's funny because, so I I pulled it up on on the document. It says, um, so Jacques Gansler was the new... Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Technology, started in December of 97. And Gonsler said, I'm trying to see if he was part of the bigot list, people who were read in. Um, anyway, Gon- so Gon- it's Jacques Gonsler who said to Wilson that, so Gonsler knew about the crash retrieval program, but he also said, he said, UFOs are real, so-called alien abduction is not real. Um, so that's Gonsler. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know if Wilson believes that. I don't know. I, I know Der- Eric Davis has made the argument. He, he's mentioned the, there are certain colleagues of mine think it's, you know, it's not not being carried out by non-humans. I don't know. I mean, I know that upset a lot of people. And I'm like, well, first of all, Davis didn't say that. And Wilson didn't say that. Jacques Gonsler said that. And it's just a it's just an aside. It, there's no evidence for any of that. I know. I know Jacques Vallée has mentioned has hinted, I'm not exactly sure what Valet said about that, but he's talked about black programs. And um, Richard Doty, you know, the lightning rod has mentioned that some mm. abductions may be carried out by military, but there's nothing else on that. So imagine that story, though. Imagine, and I know it, it upsets people, like you said, but if, if, if there was some black program that was involved in all of those abductions, do I think that's the case? I don't, but it's just an opinion, and we don't have the hard evidence. So um, 
it's definitely something to keep in mind as a possibility for maybe some abductions, but then you have my labs, you go down that road, there are people who think that's totally outrageous. There's no way the government would be keeping tabs on abductees. The government knows nothing about abductees. So yeah, I don't know. It's, um, you know, it's a conversation that has like a million branches coming off it because you've got them real or not real. Then you've got them. Are they physical or non-physical? Then you've got the idea that they're human, they're non-human. Right. And, and even if the fact that, that someone within the government said, look, we know abductions, you know, don't happen. Well, you would have to know every other potential species out there and whether or not they are definitely coming here or not to again, whether or not that is happening. So that could just be someone not being correct. But it, it was yeah, interesting. I don't know where Ganslow got that information from. I don't know who told him. It would be nice to ask him. I would like to know, where did you get that from? So, yeah, there's really not much more he could say about it. And, and even if you find that out, it's just another conversation starter, isn't it? It yeah. would only give you another 10 questions to ask. But let, let's move on. How this conversation then actually got out to the public. So this happened in 2002. Was there much discussion in the UFO community? We're talking about a time when the internet was in its infancy message boards were really starting up you still got newsletters it was a time of vhs dvds were coming into play but we didn't have the kind of social media that we have now was there ever rumors of a document like this floating out there or any parts of it being available in the public domain no and i'm trying to think if richard dolan said he was shown two pages of the of the wilson davis document in 2006 yeah, I know he did lectures on it. I'm not sure if he mentioned during those lectures if he had seen those two pages, but Richard was nice enough to tell me who showed him those two pages in 2006. And if people knew, it would change minds about the validity of the document. Um, and I'll, I'll people get frustrated. I'm just, I'm just adding that was part of my process of coming to the realization that it was this was legitimate, and it was. The entire time, Andy, I mean, I was up and down. You can ask Giuliano. I was like, you know what? I believe this happened. And then I would I would see a denial from Admiral Wilson. I'm like, maybe it didn't happen. Listen to this denial. It's so good. It's so thorough. I mean, I went up and down a lot. And then just overall, I finally came to the conclusion, in my opinion, it, the, the meeting happened. And then last year, I had two fantastic sources confirmed to me people who were in a position to know. And it's like, just out of the blue, I was like, that's great. I already had my opinion that it was legit. This is just over the top. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't think it was really spoken about that it was out there. I, I had never heard about it. I mean, I, I knew about the original meeting in 97 because I heard it on Coast to Coast in May of 97. I was listening live um, when, when Greer went on with Art Bell and he mentioned, he goes, I, I gave a briefing to this Joint Chiefs fella. And I was like, I'm listening. I'm like, that's a pretty big deal if that's true. Um, and I was given a chance to ask Miller about that in 2007. And then I was with a friend of mine who was not into UFOs. And I'm, I kicked myself at the time. I'm like, I never got to ask Will about it. But I did ask him about Greer. And I was like expecting for him to say, you know, Greer says a lot of things that don't happen. He never, he never badmouthed Greer whatsoever. He did break away from Greer, so make of that what you will. Um, so yeah, the meeting was out there in '97 when Wilson met with Greer, Mitchell, Miller, um, Greer's assistant, and another Roswell era alleged a Roswell era witness. But nothing about the documents in 2002. I had not heard anything about it until April of 2019, where Giuliano Marankovic said, "Guess what I got, guys? Check this out." And I read it and I immediately flashed back to, to 90, 1997 when I first heard Greer talk about it. So how, how did that conversation get out to the masses then in 2019? I believe it was leaked through the estate of former astronaut Edgar Mitchell. Is that correct? Yeah, he died in 2016 and his family was going to throw out all of his UFO related documents, anything related to UFOs. And then I'm not exactly sure of the person who went over there to save everything, but there's a man in Australia that Ross Coulthard has spoken about called the Spaceman. He became he became he came into possession of all of Edgar Mitchell's UFO related and space related memorabilia um, collection. And then James Rigney got a copy of the Wilson Davis. He's an Australian and the Wilson Davis notes. He met up with Grant Cameron in 
2018 at a conference, Grant Cameron was about to leave and James Rigney said, Hey, I got something. You got two minutes. I got to show you something. And Cameron's like, I'm gonna, I got to leave. I got to leave. He goes just two minutes. And Grant Cameron looked at it, saw Oak Shannon's name and right away knew, all right, this is legitimate. Um, how they got onto the internet. I do. I don't know who else. I know one person who knows this. I do know. I do know who put them on Imgur. I can't say who it is, but I'm supposed to talk to that person this week. Um, I think it's just an interesting part of the story. It's not going to give us any insight into whether it's you know legitimate or not, but it's just a part of the story. Um, so that's how it happened. If Eric, if, if Edgar Mitchell doesn't die, or if his family just throws out all of his papers, we're not here talking about this right now. He died. You know, the documents came out. I mean, Eric Davis has he, he gave me a quote for my Wilson Davis blog, which he knew I was working on talking about how they leaked from the Edgar Mitchell estate. So that right there, he said they leaked from the Edgar Mitchell estate. We could talk about also, he 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 also sought out some legal advice from a friend, a coworker, on what he should or shouldn't say about purportedly classified documents. But yeah, Edgar Mitchell, unfortunately he died, but because of it, that's how we got the Wilson Davis documents. Yeah, and again, as, as sad as that is, people commonly bring up that when someone passes away and we could even use like a, a senator harry reed that there are rumored deathbed videos why don't you think we get more from people who are of that generation now who are are passing away sadly in their, their 70s their 80s their 90s you know long may they live and, and 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 help out in the subject or enjoy their life but why don't we get more of these folks laying stuff out there on video and then saying, do you know what, when I pass, get this information out there because if they really want it out there, that is something they could do. Because it's all fake and there's nothing to it. That's the skeptical side. Um, Because you would think, you would think, I mean, I was going to say something about a deathbed confession. Um, Yeah, you don't, we don't have anything. We've had, we've had alleged deathbed confessions. People are sick. You had Ross Coulthard talking about um, Nat Colbitz, I'm not saying his name right, but he, he was dying of cancer and he told yeah. Roth that he was read into the program, although he actually never saw any craft. Um, so deathbed confessions, you would think, yeah, you would think there would be a ton of them. These folks would say, listen, I don't care what my security oath is. This is such a big story I need to tell. Maybe they don't have firsthand knowledge. Not a lot of people have firsthand knowledge of this, but it's a great question, and it, it is a good question for skeptics to bring up because there's really not there's not a lot out there. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, and not please don't take this the wrong way. Hal Putoff's getting older. Whatever Hal knows, I hope he gets it out. I hope he gets it out. Whatever information he has, and I hope Hal is around for another 10, 15 years. I think he's in his 80s. As far as um, Senator Reid, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, there was rumors. People are like, oh, supposedly he made this – this video, it is going to tell all in the video. And no, as far yeah, as the, I, the, I, the rumor was, Knapp had a copy, George Knapp had a copy of it and it was to be released upon his death. I, I suppose sense. one very sensible argument to deathbed, deathbed confessions would be as morbid as they are and, and morally questionable that these people tend to leave behind families and they wouldn't want to leave anything that, you know, it'd be very easy for a government official or, you know, private contractor to say, you know, we know what you know, and if this gets out, we'll make life difficult for your family, you know. And that doesn't have to be, you know, we'll, we'll turn up and, you know, Good point. kill them. Yeah, it can be like jobs and, you know, they'll lose their job, they'll lose their house, you know, we can make things difficult. And in that case, you're like, well, is that the legacy I want to leave for, for my family? So that's 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 a potential reason. Um, it's, but yeah. It's funny you brought up, you bring up family members. I Just real quick, uh, Kevin Randall's new book about Roswell, he talks about bodies and the evidence for bodies. And a lot of the evidence is family members who were told from their family member, yes, I, I I saw the bodies and there was also firsthand witnesses, but we don't have a body. So those are great stories. It's great. It's interesting. Crash retrievals, but we don't have the evidence yet. So I, I'm still on that boat where I, I really want to see it for myself. And Joe, I, I've said regarding Roswell, I love the case. I think it's the case that 90% of us get involved in the UFO subject as a child, hearing about Roswell and, you, and it was a one easy one to find out about. Uh, maybe newer generations are finding out about Nimitz and all that kind of stuff first. But Roswell, it's like the, the grandchildren of the people involved are now passed on. So whenever you hear about people calling for the congressional hearings, you know, get let's get Roswell out there. And you're like, well, who? Because even the people who covered up the cover up 
aren't alive anymore. So right. who your, your people who take took over projects or programs or stovepipes that branched off and branched off and branched off probably have a knowledge, but they weren't involved. They just know of something that happened because they took over something three generations down the line. So it's one of those that Roswell was a fantastic and part of lore and always will be, but there's only so much you can do. There comes a point where, like you say, it's it's someone's grandkid's grandkid who's writing books now on it. And, you know, yeah, it happens in this subject. People can take advantage of things, especially the further on they go, but I, w- I won't go into that too much. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Um, You would think... You know, I've been at this since 96 and I don't usually get frustrated, but I am starting to get to that point a little bit. Um, and Eric Davis, I, I tweeted out some stuff today. Eric Davis, no doubt, um, Ro- he believes Roswell was legitimate. You know, um, he had access, you know, John Alexander said it was a weather balloon. He's like, well, uh, and he also thought uh, Alexander thought Corso was telling a little some fibs. And, and Davis is like, I had access to information John Alexander did not have access to. And then we have Lou Elizondo talking about it. Is Lou just making it up? Is it all a cover? That's the skeptical side. Is it all a cover for our technology? That's the psyop. Everything we've heard for the last 70 years is really just a cover up for human technology. And I am open minded to every possibility. I don't think that's the case, but it's time, Andy. It's time. Put up or shut up. We have Congress involved. It should not take five more years for us to see some of this evidence. So just a little little frustrated at this point. But as we record this, uh, I had to put back my interview with John Alexander, and that is now tomorrow night as we speak. So that is something that is getting brought up with, with Mr. Alexander himself. You could, you could also say in the Wilson Davis document, Oak Shannon, in parenthesis, it says J.A. is a liar which we think that's John Alexander. You have anything to say about that? Um, and, and then you have all the MyLab stuff that people are bringing up, how John yeah. Alexander is being seen in these MyLab abductions. Um, John Alexander is another lightning rod. There are people that don't like him. There are people who, I know people who are like, he's the sweetest man. The guy's amazing. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the middle. I don't, I, I, you know, I've spoken to him. I've asked him questions when ATIP came out. I'm like, why did you say before ATIP came out? You said there were no government UFO programs. He's like, I didn't know about it. I'm like, well, now I'm looking. OSAP came out later. You didn't know about OSAP? Of course you did. Um, but maybe he just wasn't allowed to speak about it. So he had to lie. I mean, which I understand. If, you know, if you're asked point blank about something you can't talk about, it, it's kind of hard to get around it by, without lying. It's like, otherwise you give away. It's like, well, I really can't talk about that. That would that that answer would give away that there is something there. So he might have been in a bad position there. Um, so... And and the document itself, it, you, I've mentioned a lot of names uh, and some of the background, but just to run through them, if there's any that stand out to you as people of real importance, I, I'd like you just to shout out. Um, so Oak Shannon is someone you've mentioned several times. What was Oak Shannon's background again? You, you cannot talk about the document and whether or not this really happened without mentioning Oak Shannon. So he was a physicist. Um, he worked at Los Alamos from 88 to 2000. Before that, in the documents, uh, Wilson says they had, a you know, they were in the Navy together, close. Um, he trusted Oak Shannon to set up this interview with Davis. He trusted his word. Uh, they go way back in the Navy, if you believe the documents. And I would think an investigative reporter with the proper funding and the proper resources can look back into that and find pictures of them or something because Admiral Wilson now says, I don't know the guy. It's like, I forget the exact word. And he said, um, totally unknown to me. So now Wilson is saying Oak Shannon is totally unknown to him. Oak Shannon, who Billy Cox has interviewed multiple times, has said, I know both Eric Davis. This was a few years ago. He goes, I know both Eric Davis and I know Admiral Wilson. If this has caused Admiral Wilson any embarrassment, I apologize. Um, and then he followed up by saying, yes, I, he was told, well, Admiral Wilson says he doesn't know you. And, Oak Shannon, you could tell he doesn't want to lie. He doesn't want to contradict Admiral Wilson. He's like, I'm not going to contradict him. I'll just say, I know Tom Wilson. He goes, well, I knew Tom Wilson. We'll put it that way. And maybe I'm just a face, a person that you forget easily. He's he's, he's letting Wilson off the hook. It's obvious they knew each other. And, and, And I don't understand why somebody who has the resources hasn't gone and checked those records. I don't know how to do that. I've looked on Google, which has been... I find pictures of Oak Shannon. I'm like, please let me find Oak Shannon and Tom Wilson together. I have not found that. But I think somebody on a national level can do that, you know, and find that. And I, and I did. I've spoken about this on Twitter. And I did put, I, I put in my own FOIA with the National, national Nuclear 
security agency um, where they sponsored the trip from Wilson for Wilson to go to Vegas. And I, I spoke to them. I'm like, I want to get records, anything of him being in Vegas. And the lady who was so nice from the FOIA department, she goes, most likely we're not going to have anything from back then. We're not going to keep records from then. You can look. She goes, we'll try. And she tried and she said, we got nothing. Um, there's got to be something though, Andy. There's got to be something. If he came on that trip, it was a retirement trip, according to the notes, saying goodbye, tying up some loose ends. There's mm. got to be something there. Maybe there's a picture somewhere here in Vegas. I, I need to go visit some museum and like, oh my God, there's a picture of Wilson and Oak. I mean, Wilson at, you know, in 2002 in Vegas, because he says he hasn't been to Vegas since 1979 he goes i don't know how i can prove it but i haven't been to vegas since 79 i don't know eric davis i wouldn't recognize him if he walked in so it's like this just denial after denial but then the oak shannon denial is problematic and even billy cox noticed it when he wrote about it because oak shannon is a very biblical religious man i don't think he's going to make up a, a relationship with tom wilson it's, it's a shame there was no facebook back then and we could just go back and see oh, Adam wilson checked in in vegas 2002 october 16th and i looked at it, so many yeah, i looked at that i looked on facebook to see if there was any let's see let's see if oak shannon is friends with tom wilson i looked for the heck of it but i did not find that um and i wrote to oak shannon um he did not write back but yeah, I helped a little out. I helped Billy out a little bit on that. And he got a hold of Oak Shannon and, and asked him again, you sure you know, you sure you know Tom Wilson? He's like, I know Tom Wilson. Tom. Look, it's like I said, I, it's a big part of the story. If you if you really think that Oak Shannon is lying about that, I, I just don't know. I don't know what to tell people. A very well-known name that appears multiple times in the document, and you have mentioned multiple times here as well, we have to discuss is, is Dr. Stephen Greer. Now, I, I've said before on the podcast, and to be fair, in the last couple of months, we've had a whole influx of new listeners and viewers. So hello if you're if you're newer to the podcast, especially off the back of the Jeremy Corbell and, and Luella Zondo interviews the last couple of months. Um, I, I've said before, for the record, like Stephen Green, and it's just my opinion, you know, make up your own mind as with any of this subject, please. But I think he came into this subject back in, in those early years with the best of intentions and and with a good network with good contacts and as we know from this document as well he did brief people at a high level on on various different aspects of the ufo subject or at least was involved i think things changed as time went on for stephen greer and maybe that was the the, the monetary side of it maybe his views got a little bit mixed with a few different notions and who knows I just think that the Stephen Greer and his intent now is very different to what it would have been back then. That's that's my opinion, just for, for anyone curious. And it, I get Stephen Greer has a lot of fans out there. Um, for you, what was Stephen Greer's part in all of this? Because like you say, his name comes up within the document itself. I agree. I mean, I feel the same way about Greer. Um, did wonderful things in 2000 when he had the Disclosure Project. Witnesses come in. Uh, there were some there's some questionable witnesses in there. And Eric Davis has spoken about that in some interviews. He called it the shotgun approach, you know, just collect as much as you can witness wise. There were some witnesses that were not great. He goes, but there were some in there that were really good related to crash retrievals. He wouldn't go into specifics. Eric Davis wouldn't as far as who that was. Um, and then I don't know how it happened, but Dr. Stephen Greer was able to get Will Miller as his military advisor. And Will Miller is just amazing. He's like, uh, what, Leslie Kane, in her book, she called him a true insider of the highest order. I think that's exactly what she said. And so 97, he's his military advisor. Actually, 95, this is something a lot of people don't know. Will Miller writes a letter to Admiral Wilson in 1995 saying, hey, you know, Miller had been briefing people his entire career about UFOs because Miller had an experience in 1970 in Vietnam where a USO one underneath his destroyer. So it, and his, his father and grandfather were involved in the space program, but his encounter in Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin, that sparked his interest. So he was very well versed, very well versed in the subject. And he would brief higher ups in the Pentagon, the government and the military. So he wrote to Tom Wilson, who he knew, I forget exactly how they, how they knew each other. I think they served together in the Atlantic command. I'm not sure about that, but they did know each other. He wrote a letter. Hey, I, I, I'm giving briefings, blah, blah, blah. Stephen Greer would be the point person. Uh, I met Edgar Mitchell recently and another astronaut, Brian O'Leary. He goes, I would love to set up a briefing at your convenience. And by the way, I'm including some recipes for Mrs. Wilson. So yeah, they knew each other. So that was 95. 
the meeting doesn't happen. The briefing doesn't happen until 97, two years later. So it's Stephen Greer, Will Miller, Edgar Mitchell, the six men who walked on the moon, Sherry Damiak, who's Will, Greer's assistant, and then Lufkin, Stephen Lufkin, who's a alleged Roswell era witness. They go in. Wilson, there are other people there, but Wilson, so they, they sit down and they talk to him and Greer is there. And I was told Greer really didn't need to be there, um, but Greer was there. Um, it could have taken place without him. And Greer claims that he had this document, an NRO document that had code names. And um, he sent it ahead before the meeting and said, here, this is how you can get access to some of these programs. Here you go. And Greer claims that was the impetus for all of this. And and Wilson used it to go searching for this special access program. But if you look at the Wilson Davis notes, and John Greenwald did a great video on the NRO, and it may be fake. I'm not sure. There are some people who still totally defend that document. I don't know. I don't. For me, I don't care because I never made a big deal about it. If you read the Wilson Davis documents, there's not one mention of the NRO document. So whatever, maybe Wilson told him, yeah, yeah, we used it. Maybe he was just placating Greer. I don't know. But it's not in the documents. So they have the meeting. They leave. Supposedly, there was a two-hour private meeting between Miller and Wilson. Uh, Miller denied that to me, but there is a confidential list of all of the briefings that Miller gave that Leslie Kane has a copy of, somebody else has a copy of. So if that did happen, whenever those confidential, you know, Leslie Kane, if she ever decides to let it out, which she probably wouldn't because it's confidential, there is a record of all of his briefings of folks he's briefed in the Pentagon. They, they also briefed in... Early December, I'm not sure if it was early 2008, but they also briefed Wilson's boss, Patrick Hughes, who was the director of the DIA at the time. So they briefed him at his, he wanted an expedited expedited briefing because he had somebody in his family had an experience. Mm -hmm. I have suspicions about what happened and it may have been something negative related to his family, but I have not been able to confirm that. Like hitchhiker type event or? No, it's like whatever happened may have caused... May, this is, I'm, I don't remember the details. It may have caused suicide of his father. And, and please don't quote me on that, folks. But there was something negative. Anyway, Hughes wanted the, the briefing expedited for because his family was having personal experiences. I don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. And don't, like I said, I, I may be wrong about that. I'm pretty sure Greer mentions it in one of his documentaries. And then he cries. And people make fun of him for crying. But I think it might be related to Patrick Hughes and his family. I'm not sure. Um, so he got briefed too. And, and, and Patrick Hughes is like, I've asked about UFOs and I'm not told anything. He goes, here's a doll of an ET. This is what I'm told. They don't want to tell me anything. And Miller is like, that's how it is. They give them plausible deniability. They will not brief those higher ups. That's why when, you know, people make an example of, uh, you know, Lou Elizondo talks about Senator, uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis, you know, they never let him get briefed probably because that's plausible deniability. So if, if Mattis is ever asked on the oath, what, can, what do you know about UFOs? He could honestly tell the truth and say, I don't know. That's just the norm um, to protect those people. So they brief 97, April of 97. Those folks brief Miller, uh, brief Wilson. And then Wilson goes searching. It takes him two months to find this crash retrieval reverse engineering program. He calls them on the phone goes down for a meeting, and then the rest of it, as we said, they told him, sorry, sir, I know what your position is, but you do not have a need to know. Um, and Greer has, spo- Greer has spoken about this spoken about this over the years. Important player in all of this, but the whole NRO document, how much of a role, if any, it played. Like I said, last year I was told it played zero role. I did not know that when I wrote the document. So people criticize me. They're like, well, you mentioned it. You, know, you haven't updated your blog. No, I haven't updated my blog, but... <laughs> Like I said, last year, the source who I trust said, no, that NRO document, it's it's such a red herring, Andy. It doesn't matter. Read the notes. There's nothing about the NRO in there. Nothing about that document. Who cares? You know? Um, And also, people are like, why are you spending so much time on the documents when the most important story is whether or not there's a crash retrieval retrieval program? Who cares about Wilson and Davis? Who cares? That's going to be a a buy. You know, it's going to be. If we get at, if we if we get any any evidence that there's a crash retrieval program, people are not going to want to talk to Wilson. Who cares? He was denied access. Great, but for me, I spent so much time on it, and the human side of me does want to say, "I told you," you know, because the, the denials are so ridiculous. I understand being people being skeptical, but for me, 
looking at all the evidence, even taking out my sources I've spoken to, I think it's obvious the meeting happened. Um, but hopefully a year from now, we're like, who cares? Look at this. There's a crash retrieval program. I don't care if Admiral Wilson was turned down. I mean, it does tell you about how there's no oversight with these programs, if this is true, and that's a problem. But the story is the crash retrieval program, not the documents. Let me ask it in the time since you've written your your mega blog, you know, mega pints, a mm-hmm. word in the lexicon now. You had a mega blog before the mega pint was a thing. The mega Are what? The- the mega pint you know johnny depp's made the mega pint famous. Oh, okay. yeah yeah um you've got the mega blog uh are there any aspects of the document that you think now or at the time potentially contains false information for for any particular reason i don't think false information but what gives me a surprise is they talk about the bigot list people who would be read into the program and it says 400 to 800 people that seems like a lot of people for such a closely held program um if that's true, there's going to be a lot of people that can be subpoenaed and put under oath to speak about this program. Like, say it, say it's been going on for since the late '40s. That could make sense. That many years, that many people. Um, Eric Davis, uh, I pulled up a tweet today where he says one of his interviews that the program was buried so deep to hide it from the the Collins elite folks who think all of this is satanic and do whatever they can when they get in positions of power to kill any UFO related program. So Davis says it was buried to keep it from those morons. That's a quote. Um, Eric Davis does not hold back. Um, Do you nothing not think that Trump- so, with, with that number, that would include people like if he's telling the truth, a Bob Lazar who, who claims he worked on, uh, you know, a, a flying saucer, reverse engineering. There would have been other people working on it. If they did indeed have multiple flying saucers, you would imagine there might be small teams working on them, but those teams come and go if the progress has been slow over the decades, as you say, and eventually almost ground to a halt, you probably would have a high churn rate of people where it's, you know, I've got Joe and I've got Andy, they're working on this, this is their background, theoretical physics, advanced quantum physics, all that kind of stuff. They're not making much progress. Let's get them out. Let's get another couple of folks in. And then that happening in multiple locations. Yeah, you could see why that could be a 400 to 800 people list. Yeah, and and... In, in the notes, it talks about one intact craft. So nothing about Bob Lazar's, I think he said nine yeah. uh, craft he saw at Area 51. Um, it's funny because Eric Davis thinks Bob Lazar is not telling the truth. I, you know, if you read the documents, it's interesting. I'm not sure if it says in here or in one of, I think it's one of, one of Eric Davis's interviews. He said the program was put into hibernation in 1989 uh, throughout the years, it happens where they put it into hibernation and they wait for technology to advance and then they bring it out of hibernation and they try again, back reverse engineer and they fail because they can't make heads and tails out of the technology. So Bob Lazar supposedly had his work. He worked at Area 51 S4 in 1989. So at that point, I'm like, maybe there is some truth to Lazar. And I've been 50-50 on Lazar for a long time. Like I said, Eric Davis does not believe him. Eric da- uh, George Knapp and Corbell believe him 100%. I'm friends with all of those folks. so, And I stay 50-50 not to placate them. If I thought he was totally full of crap, I would say so. I don't know. But there are people out there who would like say, how could you not know? It's He's obviously lying. And then you got the other side. So I try to avoid it. It's such a, it's such a, it's such a controversial, he's such a controversial subject. I do love the story. Whether or not it's real or not, I love the Bob Lazar story. Yeah. Speaking with a friend of mine. Yeah, it's a great story. I went to see the premiere of his his documentary in LA. It was fun. He was there. Um, but I don't know. I really don't know about that. As far as how many people worked on it, yeah. It still seems like a lot, 400 to 800. I mean, they mentioned four programs in here. Wilson found four UFO-related programs. That number comes up in other places. I don't think they would all be reverse engineering. It could be biology if there are bodies. Um, Really one important thing that, you know, Edgar Mitchell started speaking about this in 2007. Uh, Giuliano set up an interview and, you know, he he was talking about how, you know, he went to visit a high level office office and he was told, yeah, you know, you cannot have access to that. And then Edgar Mitchell was on Larry King in 2008 um, and he told the story. He said, you know, I went to the Pentagon for a meeting with the Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and this gentleman, a vice admiral, said, you know, he should be in charge. Um, and then we got calls from him, from him uh, sometime later. I believe Wilson called Miller. I, I don't I don't believe he called Greer, although Greer claims Wilson called him. I think it was Miller was the point, man. Um, 
we got calls from him later saying he found the people responsible for the cover up and the people who are in the know. And he was told, I'm sorry, Admiral, you do not have a need to know. And so goodbye, because people are saying this document really, really just was a throwaway document, a script. So Edgar Mitchell was dumb enough to just take a script into his private collection and he's telling the story. But more importantly, in 2010, he was interviewed for H plus magazine and it's important. He goes, um, Greer told commander Miller who called me. And like I said, Miller is the point person. I don't know if Mitchell was trying to protect Miller. Um, Miller called me and said, yes, Greer heard from the Admiral. I don't believe that. Um, and people are like, what do you believe? You believe some stuff and not? Well, when it's Greer, it's a little questionable. But Miller was the point man, as far as I know. It says, quote, yes, Greer heard from the Admiral, and he's confirmed that there was an office in the Pentagon funding all of this. Subsequently, another contact of mine, this is Mitchell, who must also remain nameless because he's on classified programs, that's Eric Davis, encountered the Admiral in Las Vegas, where he had been looking for and trying to get into the so-called strategic access program around the UFO incident and had been denied. So that's Edgar Mitchell in 2010. So it's like, that's telling you the story. And also on Larry King, he said, he mentioned a report. He goes, we got calls from Wilson later and then a report, which I think is the Wilson Davis notes. And mm -hmm. there were more than just, there are other people. Jacques Vallée needs to be asked. When did you get your notes? Because he's been asked about this, but he wasn't really pressed. Um, it was a very small amount of people who had it. Hal Putoff would have it. Um, more people need to be asked. But like I said, the story is really not the documents. But for me, I like the story. I don't get tired of it. I've read this so many times, Andy. I mean, I still can't comprehend every name and every detail of what everybody did in this document. But it's, um, it's an interesting read for me. And... Same players I mentioned, Hal put up Kit Green. That's another question that comes up. Why is it the same people over and over again? Eric Davis, Hal put up Kit Green, Gary Nolan, Jacques Vallée. Because there's only a small amount of people who are willing to look into the subject and have their name attached to UFOs. That's always been a problem. It's still a problem. You have Travis Taylor now coming out, head of the UAP task force. Well, it's the same thing. There's not a lot of people who are willing to attach their name to it. So you're going to see the same people. I hope that changes in my lifetime where it's like every scientist wants to get in on this and give their opinion and look at the evidence. It has not happened yet. Have you ever heard of similar meetings taking place with anyone, either of the folks you've just named there or, or otherwise that just aren't as well known as this? Well, Kit Green told uh, Richard Dolan, and I'm going by memory, that he was told on several occasions that he would be read into the big mother of all UFO programs. You're going to get access to the top program. And every time it never happened. So in a similar incident, which Eric Weinstein said recently, you know who he is? The mathematician who's yes. admitted quite, quite, he was wrong. He's quite vocal on UFOs. So no one he is. As well, yeah. And he said something really interesting the other day, because we heard Sam Harris speak about how, Supposedly, people contacted him trying to get he's they're going to use him to get out information. about. I UFOs. remember. Yeah. Well, Eric Weinstein said, is it Weinstein or Weinstein? I forget. But anyway, I don't want to butcher his name. He said that he was told he was going to be shown more information. You know, I don't know if he was going to be read in. And he said every time they got to the point where they were going to show them, show him, it didn't happen, which matches what Kit Green said. So. The skeptical side of me says that's because they don't have anything. They're never going to show you. They're going to keep they're going to keep running, you know, keep tagging you along. But you're never going to get to see anything. Um, we never get to hear Congress say, I can't tell you I can't show you what I saw, but I could describe what I saw. Why not? Why can't you? Why can't these people describe what they're seeing in these videos? We have not even gotten that. So now I sound like now I sound like a debunker. See what you brought out in me, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, let, let's bring that full circle. I mentioned that this has come back into the conversation as we talk in 2022 because of Congressman Mike Gallagher submitting the Wilson Davis memo into public record. Now, that doesn't mean the documents are legitimate uh, and he Not knows that, but it's it's a huge thing. And I think I the first thing I tweeted during the hearings, Joe, I watched them live in my kitchen was um, when I heard that mentioned, I think I went straight onto Twitter and said, somewhere Joe Murdoch just let a huge scream. Um, and I didn't. I didn't. I did not. <laughs> what, I just, what was your reaction, though, when you heard that? 
I was I was calm. I was you know I was going live, so I had I had my mic open. I'm not sure, but I, I didn't really say much. I wasn't shocked. I was surprised. Um, it hit me later on, and then I can only say that Gallagher is not letting this go. So there's more there. There 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 will be more related to that. Um, but all you need to see is is Nolan talking about how we're so close to immunity. And anybody related to these crash retrieval programs, if they exist, they need immunity. And if that language is finished, that's going to be a, a huge thing. Once again, I don't know if the public's going to see it. Um, but that was a big deal. I mean, and I you know, like you said, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't prove the documents are real. But if anybody thought that Gallagher did that without doing his due diligence and looking into that, I think, I think they would be wrong to assume that. Gallagher is very, very sharp, and he came out of nowhere. I didn't know who the guy was beforehand. Yeah. So, we, you know, we have Rubio, we have Gillibrand, we have Gallego. Now we have Mike Gallagher. Yeah, and I, particularly for those of us outside of the U.S., sometimes I, I'll get the odd comment from listeners, and they'll say, you know, this this person's a Republican, this one's a Democrat, and their politics is this, this, and this. I, I don't have an interest in the politics. I, I don't particularly know, don't particularly care. I, I care even less about the, the U.K. side of things as well. It's just, you know, politicians are politicians at the end of the day. For me, the story here is their interest in the UFO subject and what they can bring to that. Not to say these people aren't nice people, bad people, or, or something in between. But yeah, Mike Gallagher made himself a bit of a UFO star in that moment. And he's someone that, given his relatively young age as well, people are now looking to to see what he can bring as things go forward. Do you think Mike Gallagher someone who, who clearly has a real interest in the subject now from his subsequent interviews? And do you think with him submitting something like the Wilson Davis memo, I agree, he clearly has done his due diligence on this and he knows more than he lets on. How well read into the subject do you think he is? And how far do you think someone with that young burgeoning political career can go with this subject? I, I don't know how, how, how much reading he has done on the subject. I know he's talked about people who have educated him on the subject saying, their favorite theory that they told Gallagher. I don't know if he said interdimensional and time travel, but um, I'm like, yeah, I love that because I, it, it gets tiring to see every news report say, you know, there, there's no evidence they're extraterrestrial. And I want to scream and say, we're not saying they're extraterrestrial. We're not saying that. We're saying anomalous with all possibilities, including time travel, interdimensional, ultra terrestrial based on this planet. So it was nice to see him say that somebody, you know, Congressman. Um, I think he'll stay on this, but I don't think he can do it himself. He needs help, and I'm sure he'll get help behind the scenes. And the people who educated him on the different theories, I'm sure they're going to help him. Um, whether or not how much pushback is going to be, the people who don't want this, who do not want this out, I'm not sure. We're going to have a battle between Congress and the folks, the folks who have this secret, who are they're not mil they're not the folks that are in office or in their positions and then they retire or they're. You know, the people who are appointed, it's not those folks. It's the po folks who are lifelong civilian employees. They're there forever. Those are the folks who have the secrets and the engineers and scientists who work in the programs. Obviously, those folks, that's most of what the bigot list was made up of. Wilson said they were scientists, the program, people who worked in the program, engineers and scientists. Um, you know, you don't tell a politician a secret like that because they're going to be out of office in two years. That's why the president wouldn't know. The president should know, but... In their thinking, you don't tell the people who are not going to be around. The folks who are there for a career, that's the folks who know. Um, so I, 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 we need the Senate. You know, Gallagher's great, but I want to see. I've seen the way Senator Gillibrand asked questions of the one gentleman who was his, I forget what position it was for the IG for, for the entire DOD. I think it was his... Um, confirmation pre-confirmation hearing but she was relentless she's like you need to find this out before you come back to me yeah um, is that the one he was quite flippant with his response and she yes, told and him up and says, you by. should have done your research on this already you shouldn't yes. give me that answer we have not seen the follow-up to that meeting i'm not sure what happened but she is not going to let this go and hopefully rubio will not either and all of the other folks and i do not care if people are like do you know how disgusting Rubio is, like you said, politics. I'm like, I understand. I don't like his politics. I'm very far left. Irrelevant in this case. Irrelevant. Absolutely. Uh, listen, let's get to listener questions, uh, Joe. We've covered and if there's anything I left out, 
uh, let me know. Oh yeah, hundred percent, Joe. You're fantastically available on uh, social media, so people can always get in touch with you, and you're you're really good at answering stuff as well. So um, yeah, I, people people watching, I will do a, I'll do an ask me anything on this or anything soon, so you can ask whatever. Awesome. Um, there's a lot of listener questions here as well. We'll get through what we can. Um, from Josh, first off, Joe. Um, Joe, can you help those of us who, this is a bit of a long question, but I'll, I'll get to the point. Um, can you help those of us who ha only have a basic understanding of who Eric Davis is get a firmer grasp on why so many people want him to be part of these confirmation uh, conversations and have this sort of info? Several times in the notes, his reputation is noted, but I think since Davis allegedly wrote the notes himself, the details are pretty light. Just who exactly is this guy? Who is Eric Davis? And how important is he to the study of the phenomenon? He's a brilliant man who is an experiencer, which, and he is not shy about talking about his experiences. And I'm sure with some people, they're like, well, he loses credibility. Well, for me, he doesn't. He's had experiences at Skinwalker Ranch. He had his sighting back in Arizona. Uh, he's very open-minded, very scientific method. He doesn't come to conclusions as far as what we're dealing with. He's written a paper with Jacques Vallée talking about the, the psychic aspects of the phenomena. It's not just physical. Um, we both, I remember talking to him about, um, about one of my favorite books, Operation Trojan Horse uh, by John Keel. And he's like, yeah, I read that in eighth grade. Uh, the most amazing memory, the most, he knows so much about ufology, no matter what you ask him about. Um, memory wise, I forgot to tell you, I asked him about something that happened in Vegas back in, I don't know if it was 2000, whatever. It was, it was such a long time ago. And it was a friend of mine who owned a print shop. He's like, oh yeah, I went in there. Yeah, 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 I remember that. I'm like, how do you remember that? So with that memory, with those clearances, with the interest in the subject, he's like the perfect combination of what you want in a UFO researcher. He has access over the years. He gets to see things. He gets to look and see things that he's interested in UFOs. There are not a lot of people who have that interest and the clearances. Um, and I had a source tell me Eric Davis was in charge of the crash retrieval portfolio. I don't have any more details on that, but um, he also speaks his mind uh, when he, he was giving interviews before his new job, the aerospace corporation put a kibosh on his media. Um, it was after the New York times article came out and it's not some, I know there are people thinking that he was shut up because you know, the powers that be don't want Eric Davis talking. That's not what it is. It's, it's work related Nothing negative, but um, he can't give media interviews. And I'm dying to hear him give media interviews because when the New York Times article came out, he's quoted talking about retrieval from off-world vehicles, and he can't give a quote because of his job. So I, a friend of mine floated an idea that we have a, a, a fund me, go fund me for him to raise like whatever he needs to retire just so he can do interviews. Um, so yeah, that memory, that knowledge... Um, an astrophysicist, it's very rare. I can't think of anybody else like that. Um, you have Travis Taylor who comes close. Um, but as far as crash retrievals, which I never was interested before, really, I, I mean, I liked Roswell, but I never dove into it. And now I, 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 once these documents came out, now I went back and listened to all his interviews. It's just amazing what he's willing to share. Why is he able to share about what he does about the crash retrieval program? If it's so classified, Hal Putoff said in one of his interviews, he's like the details of crashes are classified. So I think there's a certain line they can go up to. They know what they can go up to. Maybe he's crossed over that line. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the only, the, the only negative things I've seen is he speaks his mind. And sometimes if, if you piss him off, he'll, he'll say so, and he'll, he'll say so in no uncertain terms, what he thinks about you. Um, but hopefully he gets to speak out soon because it's been a while since he's given an interview. Yeah, I've gotten, yeah. I've gotten some quotes from him over the last couple of years, but very minimal stuff. Yeah, it'd be great to speak to Eric Davis, and he is particularly kind of sparse with interviews, and I know he's a much maligned figure at the moment, but uh, Stephen Greenstreet probably had one of Eric Davis's last interviews. For it was a good interview, too. It was office. a really good it interview. Was. Yeah, I'll put the link for it in the description. Um, but yeah, that that's something that's worth checking out as well. I think it's and fair to say Stephen had Dave... more of an interest in the subject in a positive light at the time. Yeah, and that's when Davis said he was um, a consultant to the... I don't know if he called it the UAP task force, but he said the new effort, which he it, yeah, he didn't give the name. He he confirmed it was whatever the organization was. Now he was a consultant, but wasn't right. being paid because there was no funding necessarily for it. Right, and funding is still an issue, by the way, with the yeah. with the NDAA, all of that. So anyway, 
Um, additionally, Josh has a follow-up. Can Joe speak to any particular discoveries, theories, or breakthroughs that Eric Davis has spearheaded without breaking any confidences? I don't know of any breakthroughs and anything that he has would be in that massive book Lou holds up where they talk about, it's a propulsion book, uh, Frontiers in Propulsion Science. Uh, I'm not sure if there's breakthroughs, but I know he, somebody mentioned to him, the answer is I don't know, um, but somebody mentioned to him that they think what he was involved in is fringe science. And he's like, I don't consider it fringe science. I consider it thinking outside the box. He's known for thinking outside the box. I mean, people refer to his wormhole paper and they showed some of the pictures drawn and they made fun of him. I was like, you know, cause it shows like a, a dinosaur would go through a very crude drawing, uh, going through a, a portal. And it's like, you know, the science behind that, he can explain some of the science behind that, um, which I can't un understand. Um, breakthroughs. I don't know of any particular breakthroughs. Um, I'm sure he could tell you, and I know that's not a great answer. Um, for me, it's just a combination of his knowledge, access, and interest in UFOs. Definitely. Um, something we are two people we didn't talk about, I don't think, within the body of this conversation, Joe, were Rich and Doug. Saucerlet has a question. Rich and Doug's name are mentioned several times throughout the document. Can you shed some light at all on who Rich and Doug are? They worked. They were part of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. They also recommended Eric Davis speak with Thomas Wilson. I don't know if they knew what Wilson had encountered. I'm not sure about that. A lot of people say, you know, they mentioned, you know, that it was a new chapter beginning in, you know, the AF, AFIO chapter was beginning in 2002 and they needed speakers and Rich and Doug were involved in that. One of them may have passed away, by the way. Um, and they wanted speakers and people use the argument, well, Wilson, there's no record. And, and John Alexander has made this argument. There's no record of uh, Wilson having spoken at the, the local chapter in Las Vegas. So he didn't come to Las Vegas. That's nonsense. You read the documents. There's no promise from Wilson that he's going to speak at that event. Um, let so let those... me ask you, I was going to say, Joe, because I've actually forgot to ask you the, the basic question Saucer like gave. He asks, uh, or they ask, what does Joe think of the idea Rich and Doug were actually asking Wilson about Eric Davis as a potential AFIO speaker and not Wilson as a speaker as a way to send Wilson Eric Davis's CV in the hopes Wilson would meet with him. This That's may possible. explain why John Alexander never saw Wilson at an AFIO meeting in Vegas at the time. Yeah, and I think the whole meeting who's there and who's not as a, as a red herring. Um, yeah, it's possible. They wanted Eric Davis there, but um, they were part of getting Wilson and Davis together. But Oak Shannon was the main impetus for that. Uh, that theory is possible. But like I said, the whole making a big deal that Wilson did not speak there is just such, uh, that's why you see John, Al John Alexander saying something like that. I'm like, why are you saying that? Read the documents. It's irrelevant. There's no promise from Wilson to speak at that, you know, opening of the AFIO office in Vegas. So it's just not a big deal. And people don't have to take my word. Read it. People read it. Frank Stalter is one who made a big deal about that. And we argue he still thinks the whole thing is bogus. Um, anyway, hopefully that answers his question um, for, for Rich and Doug. Nobody that I know of has spoken to them. You know, I, like I said, I think one of them passed away, but I don't think if we did get a hold of them, nobody's going to speak about it, you know, unless there's and and Andy, all of these people, if if they want to make sure if the meeting happened, you want to bring all of these people, put them under oath. So if our goal was just to prove the document and and Wilson had this meeting at this, you know, allegedly people think it was Lockheed that he went to. Um. Yeah, you would subpoena all these people who are listed and put them under oath, give them immunity, but that's not the goal. So your, your goal is to find the crash retrieval program and the people who worked in the program. We don't know any of those names. Those are the people who need to be subpoenaed. Let me ask the fo a follow-up from John Brim, because this, this is maybe a little bit on what you said there, but I think it's a really interesting thought. What are your thoughts, Joe, about NDAs being almost irrelevant as what really keeps these people quiet is the thought that they're nearly at the center of the labyrinth and like you've touched on you know people like kit green being promised that you know chasing that dragon you're going to find out the big secret you're going to know even people like lou and chris mellon they, they find out more and more and more but they they always claim that they don't know everything 
and maybe they're, they're dangled that carrot of you know keep doing what you're doing and you'll find out you know the the big thing at the end and that also keeps these folks from breaking these ndas because i suppose selfishly you would want to know if someone said to joe mergia you know joe delete your twitter account delete your patreon get rid of all your social media quit your job as a cameraman and we're going to take you into this room and we're going to tell you everything would joe mergia be tempted I would put a t- I would be tempted, but I would put a time limit on it. If you don't tell me within a month, everything is going back. Um, okay. Of course, by that time, I'm, they killed me because I didn't go by the rules. And <laughs> yeah, you've got the bullet in the head. Yep, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Maybe maybe they're being promised, and the skeptic would say, "Yeah, they're never going to be showing anything because it doesn't exist." Um, but that's a good point. You know, keep quiet, and we will show you the truth one day. Um. I cannot wait, Andy, because once we get one person who comes across as credible, a scientist who says, I handled the craft, I handled, I saw it in person. If we get multiple people saying that, I know for a lot of people that's going to be part of the PSYOP, these people are all lying. But for people who are reasonable, who are able to look at somebody and see if they're lying, that's such a giant first step. I mean, the final piece is us seeing it for ourselves. I make a joke. I've made this joke before where during congressional hearings, they get a wheel, the Roswell or whatever intact craft they have, they're going to wheel it down the aisle and say, there it is. And then they'll wheel down the bodies in the containers. There you go. Because if we do get evidence and we get proof that we have bodies that are not human, then the game's over. Everything else is all, everything else is up for debate. And if there's something non-human here, then everything related to UFOs is in play. I mean, including Skinwalker Ranch, you know, everything. So it's such a big deal. That's why I made such a big deal about this document. Um, and like I said, in my lifetime, I'll hopefully we get the proof, not just people speaking. We need to see it. We need to see it. And you could show us pictures or something, a live shot, without telling the Russians how to reverse engineer it. It's not going to help the Russians or Chinese reverse engineer just by showing the world. It's such an important secret. We need to get over that thinking. Well, talking about, you know, wanting to, to find out that ultimate answer and hoping it happens, Mikey asks, what do you think the next steps are now with the Wilson Davis memo being on public record? What happens next? Uh, immunity is next. We have to wait for that immunity language to be finished. Um, and I'm not sure that we're going to get to see the next step. If they bring in these folks in these programs, it's probably going to be behind closed doors, which I do not think is fair but that's probably what's going to happen. Um, I'm not sure how important it is to bring in Wilson, you know, to prove that he, he was denied access. I mean, it would be great for me. Um, And he said he would still take cells. He would, if he was given immunity, he would still tell the same story. Like this is nonsense, but what do people expect him to say? First of all, he said in these documents, he would deny it no matter what. Um, But if he really does, it really, this did happen. He can't tell Billy Cox. Well, if I'm given immunity, I'm going to tell the real story and you're not going to believe it. He can't say that. So I don't know what people expect him to say. Um, the next step with immunity and these folks coming in. And one more thing, you know, just a little piece. 2006, Jacques Vallée wrote a book called Stratagem. And the details in that book match the Wilson Davis document. So it's like, obviously, Vallée did have access to this. So this story's been around for a while. It's not something which is made up out of thin thin air. And Eric Davis, you know, there was a theory. People think that Eric Davis wrote this as a movie script because I think it was Greenwald who said, well, the X-Files had just been canceled and they were looking for a new UFO show. I'm like, okay, that's your theory. One of your theories, That's that didn't happen. Um, but that's the next step. And we've, we've spoken about it. I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, things seem to be moving fast. We keep hearing from multiple hearings. Within weeks, you know, I heard, I didn't hear anything about time frame. just that stuff is happening behind the scenes. So just be patient. And I always tell people that. I say, be patient. Stuff is happening. I mean, I've been at this for so long. The last four and a half years have been such a, an amazing pace. I know for some people it's still slow. But, you know, compared to what it was between 1996 and, and 2017, this is amazing. I get frustrated too at times. And I also get, I also get, um, spoiled you know I'll, I'll 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 not mock but i'll i'll, I'll dismiss the three videos or if there'll be a, an article on a major newspaper i'm like ah it's not that great well we're getting articles like we never had before yeah more people are interested in it so it's all good 
I just don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take to get to the next step of seeing people or at least hearing from congressional members saying we've spoke to some people. There is a crash retrieval program of UFOs. I have a friend who thinks, oh, there's a crash retrieval program, but it's not UFOs. It's just foreign technology or our technology. And this whole thing is about to bring our technology out from from beyond the black programs into the public sector. That's what their theory is. Well, listen, if we've got tech that can defy gravity, break the laws of physics, then for me, that's that's fascinating in itself. But then the question still goes back to when did we break those laws of physics and right. how can we now go from jet engines to this? You know, what, and, what was what was the where's the gap? How did we plug that gap in the middle? What what happened? And one of my favorite people I've spoken to on my show, Michael, or my YouTube channel, no show, but Michael Vi, he believes we've cracked gravity. Um and he, don't, he doesn't think we would ever use it unless we actually had to. So you're not going to see that technology because it's too world changing, too economy busting, you know, just, just totally upheaval in this world. If all of a sudden we have this technology that can turn be turned into a massive weapon also. Um, and I know a lot of people push back on him about that, but I don't know. I'm still, I don't know. Like you said, if we have that technology, it's just, uh, yeah, okay, show us show us what happened. Show us. Was it the 50s when everything went black, when they were researching gravity? That's an amazing story. And why was it kept secret for all this time and with the pollution going yeah. on on this planet? It's a major can of worms. Do you know what? It's a, it's a huge conversation and one for another time. But I, I've talked about this some time ago on the podcast about, you know, if that sort of alien tech or whatever it might be came out and you're like, how, how do you, how do you even begin to release that to the public? It's like, people think that if they came out and said, we'll reverse engineer a flying saucer, we can now traverse the galaxy in this incredible craft. Oh, great. So we don't have to fly anymore or drive cars. No, no, you still do because we've got one of them. Oh, so how do you reproduce it? Uh, it takes about 15 years and we can make another one maybe. Oh, well, are you going to give this to the public? No, because we still aren't sure on X, Y. And there's a whole conversation. Same with if you can suddenly cure an illness. How do you decide who gets the cure and when they get the cure? And that there's a whole conversation that people don't think of, that it's just things don't change tomorrow. You would still go to work. You would still drive your petrol and diesel cars, right. your hybrid cars. And yeah, it's, but it's, yeah, it's a very interesting one. Um, question from Pitt. He says, Joe, you've said on multiple occasions and throughout your blog series that you got corroborating information from trustworthy but anonymous sources. I don't want to know about those sources' names or anything, only what even vaguely they said and why you consider them trustworthy. Yeah, and I, I think that person asked me that the other day on Twitter. I don't know if it was corroboration of the words I used, but people in a position to know told me that the meeting took place. So... And people want me to give more details. I'm not going to give more details. Um, I don't want to risk outing these people whatsoever. So I don't want to say, I just, within the last year, that information came to me. And it wasn't something I reached out for. I wasn't asking questions about Wilson Davis. It's just, they offered up that information. Um, How do you and, know they weren't lying to you? Say again? How, how do you know they weren't lying to you? Let me I can't, advocate here. Yeah, that's that's me judge, me making a judgment call. It's not like the only thing I heard from these folks. Um, and I do have a pretty good track record. And as an example, one source told me two years ago, like I said, Travis Taylor works for the UAP task force. Didn't use the UAP task force name. But when I heard that, Knapp was doing something on the chief scientist. I told people behind the scenes, I'm like, I think that's Travis Taylor. That's based on a source. So 100% accurate information. Um, New York Times is writing an article. It's going to be on crash retrievals. Accurate sources, all accurate. Uh, New York Times is writing an article in 2017. Got that beforehand. Accurate. So I have been lied to before, Andy, though. And and I knew as soon as the information came in, I'm like, this is not true. Uh, I've also been pumped up on the phone with really you just explained it was about wilson davis and somebody said you just and i explained why i thought it was legitimate and they said your explanation is probably the best explanation i've ever heard and i knew it wasn't because i didn't really make an effort it was just like i just said blah 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 and i was like this person is for whatever reason they're pumping me up trying to make me feel better which is a, i would think that's maybe an intel trick you know the people in this world um so i do pay attention to that and i do question things. I don't think I was lied to, but only time will tell. So, um, you know, let's see what Gallagher uncovers. And I think I would think if we do 
like say Wilson Davis, they say, listen, we don't care about Wilson Davis. We care about the crash retrieval program. If that is proven, I hope people accept, I would think it, maybe Eric Davis can talk about it at that point. Um, but I would think people would accept this was legitimate. So it would be another source that was accurate. Um, but I can't prove it. I can't prove I wasn't lied to. I do think about it though. It's not like, don't think about it. It's not like I hear something right away up. Oh, that's true. 100%. Um, I had my own opinion before those sources told me that. So it was just, it was just confirmation for me, not for anybody else. And I realized I can't tell anybody who the sources are. So it kind of sucks for them. Um, but you're gonna, we're going to have to wait and see on this one. Yeah, I think with the history of this subject, and I was saying this to some of the, the UK guys in a group chat just yesterday or the day before without going into detail, like I think it's a little bit foolhardy in this subject to, to not at least, even with your, your hardest hardcore beliefs, depending on sources, that you, you keep that 1% back of, yeah, but what if it's not true? You know, and, and I've used the example I've said before, I'm I'm a, a, a fan, if you want to call it that, of Louis Elizondo, what he's done, the work he does and and what he's managed to get out himself, Chris Mellon and others. But I think you've got to keep that one percent of given the history and nature of this subject and what we're right. talking about. What if it came out tomorrow that they were all disinfo guys and, you know, you have to move on and you have to be able to do that and just have that element of what would be next? and have that conversation and at least understand why other people are distrusting or unsure and uncomfortable when it comes to sources or, or commitment in the subject, because there's a long history of, of lies. And yeah, yeah I, and I understand that. I do understand it. The problem I have is when people say, well, they used to work for the DOD. So they're lying. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. There are people who work in the government who have had experiences. There are people who work in the government who have an interest in this subject. Well, Richard Doty was a CI counterintelligence agency. So, you know, Lou Elizondo is too. So they're both liars. It's like, no, 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 no. You need to take every case on an individual basis. Um, look, look, when I said to you that I'm open to the PSYOP, I, I, I leave a little bit open to the PSYOP angle where it's black technology they're trying to get out. You would have not heard that from me a few months ago. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to keep my mind open to everything, all possibilities. So, yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. Keep your mind open to the possibility you're being fed nonsense. Although people think I'm a believer, I'm not. Um, but I do have strong opinions on some of this stuff. Yeah, I've got a pie chart of all my UFO interests and everything's in that pie chart. But <laughs> in that 1% bracket, there's a little other category. And within that, there's the interest in the fact that Linda Moulton Howe is speaking to people who are based as super soldiers in Antarctica, dealing oh. with human alien hybrids. And there's that, oh, wouldn't it be great if that were true, but it's probably yeah. not. But let's just park it over there in that other category. And that's great if people want to discuss that. So um, I, but I'm, I'm going way off on a tangent now. Um, no, 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 I, I agree. I, I gr I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I agree. I love some of the stories she tells and some of her sources, but it's like, I need to see some evidence. I mean, I don't hear that anywhere else. I mean, I would that would be the most amazing story. Super soldiers, we're going to Mars. We have jump rooms. Incredible. But <laughs> did did you like, ever listen, Joe, to Andrew D. Basiaggio? Yes, my ex-wife yeah. loved him. She wanted him to right. she wanted him to run for president. I'm like, yeah, come he, on. Right. Okay. So for anyone unaware, and some of you may be, but very quickly. Before I had the podcast and before To The Stars Academy and all that stuff, I used to watch some of his his lectures on YouTube and they go for four and five hours. Oh. He speaks so eloquently. <laughs> he he never really trips up in his story. He talks about, to very quickly give you an idea of it, how as a child, his father was involved in the military, intelligence, etc. He was a bit of a child prodigy. He was picked along with others, including Barack Obama, um, as children to jump and with these special jump rooms across the states they've jumped to mars they've traveled back in time you know birth of christ all that kind of stuff and he was picked to be president but each time a presidential election came on something happened that the timeline shifted and it moved along um something weird happened though that in the last couple of years apparently i don't know how true this is he's kind of gone away and he he lost his eyesight and went blind Oh, but I, I, didn't know that. I don't know if that's that's correct or not. Just the guy who runs his Facebook page. And it's it was always, for me, a great, wow, what if that was even partly true? But until Barack Obama comes out and goes, oh, that's my friend Andy Basiaggio. And yeah, I remember him from the jump rooms back on Mars. Then it's always just going to be that story. But yeah, totally oh. digressing. But that, yeah. that kind of stuff used to really interest me. But just as a, a guilty pleasure. Look, this is my Barack Obama. Uh, look, uh, 
Andy and I went, we went to Mars together. Uh, look, uh, we had a great time and, uh, Hillary was my vice president on Mars. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope it, it would be a great story and it would be great if it was true. Yeah. I hope we have jump rooms, but you know, we don't have, we have to leave that, like you said, in the other bin and hopefully one day, you know, we're totally blown away and said, what a bunch of idiots we were. We thought Andy, Randy Kramer and, and Andrew Basaggio or, and there's another, there's so many other guys like that too. There's a Corey Good, all those folks. I think he was one of those guys too that talked about a jump room, right? Or no? Yeah, some, something along those lines, yeah. I but... couldn't utter that name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nah, nah you've invoked the name. <laughs> um, but maybe that'll be page 18 of the memo when that comes out one day. Uh, <laughs> question from Phil. Phil asks, I wonder whether there is a connection between the memo and Skinwalker Ranch, as Bob Bigelow is strangely and intimately tied to both. Any thoughts? I don't know if Bigelow is really tied to this. I mean, he's because not, he he's wasn't not named, does he? Like, and, no, and Eric Davis was not working for NIDS at the time. Like I said, um, the more interesting thing is to figure out who Mary it. I don't know. As far as Skinwalker, I don't know of any tie. Um, the most interesting person in this, in this document is Mary Elliott. Um, nobody knows. I've asked, I have gotten a big, sorry, can't tell you anything about her. Um, there was a, a, a researcher who, think figured thought she figured out who she was and what aerospace company she was connected to but i was told that was incorrect um if people remember brit on twitter so i don't know but mary elizabeth elliott and the trw story i think it's crash retrieval related um it's the biggest mystery i've not been able to find anything her her lawyer jeffrey griffith he's been on some you know some ufo related websites making comments but not related to that so Possibly is that is that an alias that was used, a pseudonym, you know? I don't think I was not told it was an alias. I was just told, sorry, I cannot tell you anything about her. Um, so what is so secret? Is it it's gotta be crash retrieval related. If it's that secret, it just says it says Wilson says Mary Elliott sounds like the real deal based on her info and behavior with her attorney. Probably will only come totally clean on her deathbed 30 years from now. It's like, what is that? That's for me. That's the biggest mystery of this document. Um, I don't know how to find out about her. Like I said, I asked somebody who might know, and it was like, sorry, can't tell you anything. Well, I think except I was told the person who Brit found, who she thought was Mary Elliot, was not the person. Whether or not I was lied to to cover up this, you know, that Brit was accurate, I don't know. And I told Brit that I'm like, maybe my information is a lie. I don't know, but that's what I. That's what I have. Brett kind of came and went. Brett disappeared. Yeah, I don't know where whole, she went. Yeah. Yeah, there was a whole story there, but we won't go into I that. I know the story, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Not shocked. Um, Third Eye asks a question. I want to know why uh, Joe thinks we are being kept in the dark about this. Why can we not be told the truth, in your view? What is it we can't be told? Why can't we have the basics, at least? Yeah, Um. there's so many possibilities. One, it doesn't exist, so there is no truth. Two, it's all technology. You know, they don't want to let this technology out and they want to milk it for as much money as possible. And, you know, my opinions are all across the board. I don't know. Um, three, the story is so ridiculously unsettling that they just don't feel they can tell the general public without total, you know, people panicking. And, and Lou Elizondo has said, well, you know, we've had disclosure. The government's telling you the UAP are real. People haven't freaked out. I'm like, first of all, the general, the masses have not accepted that this is real. Number two, just because there are craft in the sky, the backstory has not been explained. If the backstory has anything with to do with humans being manipulated by something non-human or something that's above us in the food chain, people aren't going to be able to accept that easily. Um, what other reasons why, you know, there's a, there's a Kit Green quote in the alien autopsy email. Um, he talks about some of the pictures he was shown before the alien autopsy video came out that he says match the alien autopsy. He says the people in charge just don't think we we deserve to know the truth. You know, we're more worried about football on Sunday, um, you know, and celebrities. We can't handle we can't even understand how important this is. So we should not be told the truth. And it's like you look at society and it's like they might have a point there because most people care more about Kim Kardashian than they do about. UFOs, we can't, it's still a problem, Andy. We still can't get the masses interested. I mean, I know it's changing, but it's very slow. Um, Joe, so there's I, a lot of possibilities. I, I mentioned jokingly Johnny Depp earlier and his mega pint, but I remember when the hearings were on, on live, 
I think someone commented how there were 40,000 views at the time on that particular channel and that's so many more than normally that channel gets and wow isn't this amazing and I said yeah but at the same time there were 4 million people watching Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard I was in the kitchen watching on YouTube the congressional hearing. My wife was in my sitting room, living room, watching court courtroom TV with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, and she had no interest in the US stuff. I was telling her, oh, they're, they're talking about Roswell. They've mentioned crashes and metamaterials and all this stuff. And she was like, all right, yeah, but listen to this lawyer. This guy's funny. And it's that's not <laughs> a slight on my wife, but no. that's just where the general populace are at with this conversation still, that those two conversations could be happening and it's infinitely more popular as to what's happening between Jack Sparrow and Aquaman's girlfriend. And I and I made an effort not to watch it. I mean, I think I tuned in one day for a minute and like turn it off. And I love I love courtroom legal stuff, but on this one, I'm like, no, no, and it's too much other stuff going on, like you said. So it's a little depressing. And you know, my family is still. I've had some bites here and there. I've had people at work say, yeah, I'm interested. Send me stuff. And then I send them. They're like, thanks. Nothing else. They don't want to hear from me again. Um, I've had that happen several times. Joe, I'm going to finish off with a, a negative question, but just to be fair and address the balance of everything as well. This was from uh, Area503, who was having a little bit of a troll, I think, on the Twitter feed. But I'm okay. going to ask this to cover all the bases. I know you won't mind. I never do. No, that's um, fine. Joe, why would you dive into a document that has been proven to be entirely false? Save your time. Admiral Wilson has categorically denied this meeting took place and even stated, I would not know Eric Davis if he walked up to me and said hi. It's like, and when I was when I was working on the document, or I wasn't sure if it was real, I, I dove in. Um, I had an experience where I worked on an article, um, a really, not not as big as this one, but I worked on an article where I came to a conclusion, I thought I was the only one that knew this. And when it turned out, I was wrong. And it was such a, a kick to the gut. And it was related to sports and a rape case. Um, so when I was, and it was, it was definitely, it hurt me because I was like, my God, you were delusional to think that you were right about this and nobody else in the world knew except you. This is a little different, obviously, because they have sources. But still along the way, as, as I was working on it, I'm like, what if this is happening again? You made this mistake one time. You were so obsessed by this. You couldn't see the truth. Maybe this is what's going on here. Um, so yeah, I did think about that. Um, it took me a long time to finally, you know, form my opinion on this. And one thing I say, I'm friends with Eric Davis. He knew I was working on this document or this mega blog. Not once did he ever say, Hey, don't waste your time. Um, He's also never denied it. And that's a big deal. It's a big deal to me. Um, that's not evidence of anything, you know, but I consider him a friend, a pretty good friend as far as an internet friend. We've only spoken on the phone once. Um, I would think he would say like, you know, just, just wait, don't waste. He knew how long, how he knew I was working night and day on it. So never told me stop. He did give me a quote for it related to Edgar Mitchell, you know, and which I, I, I talked about before how it leaked from his estate. Um, so yeah, um, always thought about it. Wilson's denials will always give me pause because they're really, really strong. Um, I don't know, even if Wilson was given immunity, I don't know what's going through his mind if he would still deny it. But like I said, he is not the important part here. These documents are great for discussion. I love them. They're not the important part of the story. Let's see if we ever get information from people who worked in these programs. That's the most important thing. Get them immunity. Um, and if people don't believe this is legitimate, that's fine. Um, it's, it's kind of a waste of time to argue at this point. Um, early on, you probably would have made me think twice. Now I don't, but I understand people are skeptical that, you know, that that's not a totally rare opinion. What you just read to me, um, whether or not I wasted this much time on it, we shall see. Joe, I think you've nicely wrapped up the what I was going to ask you to do at the end anyway. Thank you very much for your time in this inaugural deep dive episode. I think rather than timeline, it's been more of a deep dive, and that's a better name for it going forward. Um, Joe, I've I've never had in the fact that um, I support you on Patreon because I really do appreciate the work you do. I think your your blogs are fantastic. The information held within there is great. I don't always like anyone. I don't always agree with you on Twitter, but. I enjoy the way you engage with folks and how active you are and, and how knowledgeable you are in those contacts as well. So thank you very much from myself because I really do appreciate the work you do. I appreciate it, Andy, very much. Uh, 
love your shows. I always play them when I'm around here cleaning the house. And Travis Taylor was great. And also, please, people, check out for all of the details. Check out Dolan's Deep Dive with Mr. X and Giuliano Marankovic. You, you need to, Marankovic, you need to link to his his website has every link about Wilson Davis, you know, from the beginning. It's just amazing work by Giuliano, who just does it for the love of it. Guy never gets burned out either. It's amazing. But thank you, Andy. I had a great time. All of those links are in the description for this show. Uh, you should see my first interview with Joe himself, where we discuss your background, your research, your thoughts, opinions. So if anyone's wondering, you know, Joe Murgia, you know, you've not asked about his background and stuff. We've done all that before. That link will be there. Check out Joe's website, ufojoe.net. Please follow Joe on Twitter. Uh, Joe, what's your Twitter handle? Because it changed, it's doesn't it, when you lost the account? At the UFO Joe. At the UFO Joe. You'll see. Joe's got like 22,500 followers or something now. So you'll, you'll know the right one. And he's very active on there as well. Um, I've got the links to the documents themselves will be in the description, Giuliano's website, uh, Richard Dolan's five hour deep dive, the basement office episode, and also the link to Jacques Vallée's stratagem book, which uh, Joe mentioned as well before. Hope you've enjoyed this show. It's the first of many to come. And if you've got any suggestions for a further deep dive, let me know what you would want that to be and any potential guests. And once again, Joe, thanks for your time. Thanks again, Andy. Hope to do it again sometime in the future. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditated game of fate full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. And I climbed out the window after the elf And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head And everything was weird and everything was red I called up my boys, they thought this was noise They thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys They thought it was my problems and they think I should take care of me And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me